Hey, I'm Kalib, a second year medical student at the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine. In our last episode, we watched somites appear along the embryo's axis, repeating blocks of condensed mesoderm that lay down the body plan. There were about 44 pairs in total, and by the end of week three, each somite was already splitting into three parts, the dermatome, myotome, and the sclerotome. Today, we're focusing on the sclerotome because from these cluster of cells comes one of the most important structures in the body, the vertebral column. By the fourth week, sclerotome cells begin migrating inward. They stream toward the midline and wrap themselves around two anchor points, the notochord in front and the neural tube just behind it. This organized condensation gives rise to three regions. Ventrally, the sclerotome surrounds the notochord to form the centrum or vertebral body. Dorsally, other cells arch around the neural tube to create the vertebral arch, and laterally, small buds extend outwards as costal processes. In the thoracic region, these costal processes elongate and become the ribs. At first, they're cartilaginous, but later, they ossify into bone. In the cervical region, costal processes remain small and become the anterior tubercles of the transverse processes. In the lumbar region, they thicken into the transverse processes, on the sacral region, they expand broadly as the sacral ali that help anchor the pelvis. This careful regional variation is how a single repeating template gives rise to very different structures across the spine. All right, back to the notochord. So quick confession, the thoracic vertebrae and rib animation from earlier looked slick, but it did gloss over a few steps. So let's zoom in and do this properly from the sclerotome's point of view across a few somites. Here's the setup we used. We have our notochord in the middle, so my pairs three through six on either side, I picked these at random. Um, and timeline wise, this would put us at about the middle of the fourth week of embryonic development. I'll call this end cranial towards the head and that end caudal towards the tail. And that kind of completes the overview of our setup. So if you'll remember from our last video, I hinted that somite counts kind of mirror vertebral counts, seven cervical, 12 thoracic, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not a one-to-one -one in the way that you might initially expect. Each vertebrae is actually built from two adjacent somites after a little reshuffle called resegmentation. That's the fun part we're about to go into now. Now, recall that the ventromedial part of each somite becomes sclerotome, like we talked about. Inside the sclerotome, the cranial half is more loosely packed mesenchyme, and the caudal half is more densely packed mesenchyme. That's not just a random texture, though, and it means that we have different levels of, you know, quote, quote unquote, stickiness and extracellular matrix uh, that carves a real cleft between them, known as von Ebner's fissure. Now, the brief 10 second summary of the signaling molecules involved is that Sonic the Hedgehog from the notochord basically says be sclerotome and helps nearby cells loosen up and migrate. And a simple anterior posterior notch jagged based barcode inside each somite tells the cranial and caudal halves to behave differently. That's enough detail for our purposes. Now, for the resegmentation move itself, cells from the dense caudal half of one somite fuse with the loose cranial half half of the next somite, and together they build a single intersegmental vertebral body called the centrum. And it's called intersegmental because it forms between the original somite boundaries and not inside just one alone. As the sclerotome condenses, it doesn't turn straight into bone. First, those cells form a cartilaginous model of the future vertebrae. Inside the centra, the notochord is gradually pushed out as cartilage fills in. Later, ossification replaces that cartilage with bone, but the notochord doesn't completely vanish. At the spaces between vertebral bodies, it lingers and swells into the nucleus pulposus, the jelly-like core of each intervertebral disc. Around it, the sclerotome contributes concentric rings of fibrocartilage called the annulus fibrosus, and together, these two create the spine's shock absorbers. Meanwhile, the sclerotome that surrounds the neural tube also passes through a cartilaginous phase before fusing in the midline to form the vertebral arch. And if that fusion doesn't happen correctly, well, that's a story we'll get back to in a future video. Altogether, this process produces a segmented yet flexible column that supports the body and protects the nervous system while also providing a scaffold for future muscle attachments. But things can go wrong 
and if one of the vertebrae fails to form, you get a wedge-shaped hemivertebrae, a common cause of scoliosis. If the midline fails to fuse, you might see a butterfly vertebra. In more severe cases, multiple vertebrae can fuse together as in clipal fail syndrome. Accessory ribs are another variation. Lumbar ribs usually go unnoticed, but cervical ribs, which extend from the seventh cervical vertebra, can press on the brachial plexus or nearby vessels, causing pain, numbness, or circulation problems in the upper limb. And beyond these structural quirks, the vertebral column's partnership with the spinal cord is just as important. Early in the embryo, the cord and column are the same length, but as growth continues, the vertebral column outpaces the spinal column. By the time of birth, the spinal cord usually ends at around the level of L3, and in the adult, it finishes even higher at around L1 or L2. Everything below that point isn't cord anymore, it's a trailing bundle of nerve roots called the cauda equina. So why does this matter? Well, clinically, it explains where we can safely access the spinal canal. In adults, lumbar punctures and epidurals are performed below L3, usually around L4 or L5, because at that level, you're threading the needle into a fluid space without risking damage to the spinal cord itself. Instead, you're just kind of pushing aside these floating nerve roots. In infants, though, the cord ends a little lower, so care has to be taken to choose the right level. So, from a simple block of mesoderm, the embryo sculpts a backbone with remarkable precision. Vertebrae, ribs, intervertebral discs, and the protective spaces that house nerves and vessels. In our next episode, we'll cover some very important spinal defects that trace their way back to these early steps. These include spina bifida occulta, meningocele, and meningomyelocele. Till then, I hope you all have a wonderful time, and I'll see you then.